We'll get started right now. Thank you, Molly. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Jody Milanese, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs at the National Small Business Association. Uh, before we begin for our Economic Development Issue Committee call today, I just hope everyone is doing well and you're all staying safe. I know it's a, it's a very difficult time on all of us in our small business community, uh, but I want you to know here at NSBA, we're doing our best to keep focusing on the issues that impact your business um, at hand. So with that said, I wanna thank you all for joining our uh, NSBA Economic Development Issue Committee webinar. As you know, this committee meets quarterly and participants receive briefings and updates on important issues. We always get to hear from expert guest speakers on key topics and I'm very excited to have Martha joining us today, um, receive answers to relevant questions, and are able to provide feedback and opinions and forward issues for overall association consideration. Just as a reminder to everyone, uh, the committee is chaired by Gary Brand. Gary is the president of Brand Furlan Advisors in Savannah, Georgia. He also serves as an education fellow at the School of Entrepreneurship in, uh, at Florida State University, which is the largest school of entrepreneurship in the country. I am the primary NSBA staff contact. I'm now gonna turn our web over to Gary, who will introduce our guest for today's uh, meeting. So Gary. Thank you, Jody. And thank everybody for attending. I'm pleased to introduce our guest, Martha Leg Miller, who is named the first director of the Office of the Advocate for Small Business Capital Formation at the SEC. The office is responsible for advocating for small businesses and their investors by con conducting research, analyzing the potential small business impact of proposed regulations and promote the interests of small businesses and their investors. Prior to joining the SEC, Ms. Miller was a partner at, uh, in a law firm in Birmingham, Alabama, where she represented companies and investors across a spectrum of corporate transactions. For today's webcast, Ms. Miller will introduce us to the Office of the Capital Formation and what her office does for small entrepreneurs. Ms. Miller will share her problems uh, her office has identified small businesses have in securing access to capital. Additionally, we're going to hear about the SEC concept release on the harmonization of exempt offerings and what we might expect from the commission in the future. The Office of the Advocate published its inaugural report on the ability for small businesses in the U.S. to access capital growth. Ms. Miller will share the results of the report as it outlines the options for all businesses to raise capital under both exempt and public offerings. As Jody said in the beginning, Martha is going to uh, answer questions uh, as she goes to the different topics rather than waiting for the end. Plus, in the first five minutes, Martha will address the current crisis and the SEC's role. I'm gonna turn it over to Martha now. Martha? Gary, thank you very much. I appreciate that warm introduction. And I thank all of you for um, NSBA for the invitation to join you today and to meet virtually. Um, and I thank each of you for taking the time out of what I know is, in, in spite of the fact that we're all, I think, working from home for the most part or social distancing, um, that does not mean that that equates to more time on all of our hands. And so I appreciate each of you taking time to join in the conversation today and to talk a little bit about our office as well as how we are working to support you and to give your perspective and feedback. Um, I get to come with a I come with a lovely disclaimer coming from a federal agency, which is that the statements that I make should be construed as my own and not necessarily those of the entire commission. Um, but I think that you probably assume that I wasn't speaking for 400 or 4,500 people um, when I speak and give my own perspective. But that frees me up to be a little bit more candid today. Um, before I dive into our slides, and I've got some slides that I think that we'll share those with you guys and make those available through NSBA afterwards. Um, 
wanted to flag a little bit about who we are at the SEC because most of you are probably familiar with the SEC as an independent agency and you really think of us, most people at least do, in the context of our public markets. Um, we are the regulator of the capital markets. You know, our mission is to protect investors, to ensure fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. And most people associate that with public companies and the marketplace participants in the public markets. But we also are very involved and write the rules for how companies, uh, particularly small businesses, raise capital in the private markets through what we refer to as exempt offerings. And so um, I usually have to start with that lovely um, introduction of who our you know, agency is and why we are focused on entrepreneurship, because we do care very much so about that. Um, and Congress created our office, so I am in the director of a new office that was created through bipartisan legislation, and um, that was created at the end of 2016, and we stood it up officially just over a year ago. Um, and broad support was received for that, and so you'll see a little bit when we start talking through what we're doing and the types of things we're looking at, you're going to realize why it was bipartisan. There's no partisanship to supporting entrepreneurs and to the enthusiasm around what small businesses bring to the economy. So what I'm going to do is share um, some slides that can guide us and just give some visualizations to accompany my discussion. Does that sound good? Yes, that's great, Martha, and uh, you should be all preparing your screen. Okay, perfect. Now, okay, let's see. Let's see, it's trying to, it's asking me for some privacy. One second. There we go. Let's see, it's telling me I have to quit out of this to show the screen. Are you able to see the screen yet? Not yet. Oh, there, there we go. go. Do you see it? Okay, perfect. Gotta love some lovely error message pop-ups that make absolutely no sense um, from the computer. But here we go. Let's dive in. Um, the lovely disclaimer is on this first slide. So what I would like to do is to talk through kind of who is our office. This is a really long title. Um, I mentioned that we're an independent office within the SEC. We're an advocacy-focused office. A lot of people ask us, what do you mean by advocacy? They're familiar with that in the legal context, um, but it really means one called to use your voice for others. Um, and we work with small businesses from startups that are the very smallest small businesses all the way up to, you know, growing private companies that are getting ready to go public as well as small public companies. And we're focused specifically on capital formation, which is the deployment of capital by investors to create economic growth in companies. So um, we work collaboratively with other federal agencies, but we are very much so focused on investor capital as opposed to other sources of capital, such as bank loans um, and other things that our corollary federal financial regulators work on. So in the inaugural year of our office, and this is pulling the beginnings of a full page spread, um, at the beginnings, you know, our office has done quite a lot since launching in January of last year. Um, and a lot of this is detailed in our annual report. Um, a link is going to be shown on the screen in just a minute if you want to download a copy and look at it. It's actually got quite a lot of information in there that's not just a retrospective learning about our office, but really learning about the markets. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to flag, and this is a link to our, you can see if you go to sec.gov slash OASC, that has a link to our office's web page. Um, and the reason that I put this one up here, we've got a video gallery, and that video gallery is something that's really unique that our office has put together. And we have done this to support what we have done as an office um, to facilitate people understanding what rule changes are coming down the road and how they can engage with those. And so we've put these capsule videos out there. You'll see um, one at the top of the page that's cutting off uh, my colleague Jessica McKinney's, the bottom portion or third of her face. Um, but that is a video summarizing our accredited investor proposal, um, which I'll highlight just a little bit. And we've put these together. They're three to five minute little videos that you can see, and we've shared them on social media through the SEC's accounts. 
And those make it really easy to engage and to figure out what's happening and to understand from a very high level without a bunch of legalese and jargon incorporated. So I encourage you to check out those videos. Um, as Gary mentioned, I wanted to highlight before we really dive into substance and talking about a lot of the issues, what are some of the COVID-19 resources for small businesses that exist? And how can you avail yourself of them? Because I think that's probably one of the top questions that each of you have. Um, you know, I think being a part of the SEC and in a leadership role with a wonderful agency, I am very grateful and supportive for our strong leadership across the commission. We have been, we were the first federal agency to transition to a mandatory telework posture. Um, and we have been able to remain fully functional um, as we have transitioned our entire workforce remotely. And the commission has been working diligently to provide guidance and targeted regulatory assistance and relief where appropriate. So a couple of the things that I'll highlight that may be of interest to you, um, we have extended the comment periods for a number of different initiatives and rulemakings. Um, I, I just mentioned accredited investor. Um, that's a topic that many of you may be familiar with if you are out raising capital through the exempt markets and are looking um, at sources of capital. You often uh, need to look to those that are higher net worth, higher income, who are more eligible to invest in a, in a broader variety of offerings with fewer restrictions. The accredited investor proposal was put out by the SEC in December, and it was set to close right as everything really picked up with COVID-19. And so that comment period has been extended through May 1st. The proposal was going to add an alternative means of qualifying as somebody who is accredited, in other words, eligible to invest in small businesses by adding new categories for natural persons based upon experience and sophistication as well as a few other changes, such as a catch-all category for entities owning in excess of $5 million in investment. So happy to answer any questions about that to the extent that anyone has any targeted questions there. A couple of other changes that we have made um, include providing some temporary relief for what types of things you need to get notarized, um, as well as some filing relief for the time that you have to prepare various filings. So for example, if you're a if you've raised capital using regulation of crowdfunding, um, providing a little bit more time for you to get your annual filings ready and submitted, um, really intended to account for the fact that it may be taking people longer right now to get the information they need to correspond with their accountants and lawyers, and so we're sensitive to that. Um, one thing that you will not see that you may be wondering is, okay, what is the size of our grant program and how do you apply for it? Um, we are one of the few agencies that doesn't actually provide funding to companies through grants or loans or other programs. And the reason is we are the regulators of our capital market system. So we work with the multi-trillion dollar industry that funds businesses. And we are very much so focused on making sure that the markets work very effectively and efficiently between private parties as opposed to us being a funding source. So when we do distribute funds as an agency, those tend to go towards whistleblowers, as well as towards investors when we have recovered funds in cases of fraud or financial mismanagement issues. Um, so that's a very high level. We're going to continue to assess the impacts relating to COVID-19 on small businesses and their investors and consider additional relief from other regulatory requirements where necessary or appropriate. So if you have thoughts on how the commission can support small business um, during this challenging time. I really do encourage you to reach out and to let us know what you think. Um, the link that you see on this page has a link to our website. We have got a COVID-19 resources page that we have put together and we are updating it regularly. I mean, we just updated it again this week. And that includes links to helpful information, information such as the SBA's disaster loan program and the paycheck protection program. Um, as well as a number of other resources that are particularly helpful for entrepreneurs and small businesses looking to navigate and to understand resources, potential best practices, and opportunities to leverage what other people are doing to try to grow as you come through this really tough time. So I'll pause right there just to take any questions that are specific to COVID-19 before diving in to some of the additional talking points. 
know, Jody or Molly, if you've got any questions that you wanted to flag that have been raised. We do have questions coming in, um, Martha. I'm not seeing any that are specific to COVID-19, though. So, um, I had a question for Martha about COVID-19. Um, this is Gary. Sure. I understand that um, the SEC's initiatives uh, one of them is, is um, for guidance for regulatory assistance. And I see that the initiative calls for, for you to hold virtual meetings. So, so far, the virtual meetings you've held, Martha, um, what has been the greatest concern? Gary, that's a great question. So that is something that our team, and we've got a number of team members. I should have shut everybody else out that's on the phone right now, but we've got a number of members of our team that have dialed in. They're on mute right now, and they are all passionate advocates for small businesses. And so when we were pivoting and we had all kinds of fantastic events in person and conferences planned um, over the course of the next couple of months, and when we realized what was happening with COVID-19, we shifted and said, okay, we need to change how we're engaging with folks. And so our office actually took that on and decided, let's launch a series of virtual events and let's reach out to organizations and partner. And it was perfect timing um, when Jody reached out from NSBA and said, we'd love for you to come and meet with us. And we said, that sounds great. Um, what we're trying to do is host virtual events and meet people where they are using technology and to have conversations and to get feedback. So some of the feedback, Gary, that we have received um, has been, you know, that a lot of companies are uncertain about the current federal assistance programs and recognizing that it may not be enough to get them through um, all of this and that they have needed to switch in many cases from raising growth capital to grow the business to survival capital, just to make it through. And so we have been hearing a lot of feedback on ways that the rules may need to be tweaked or adjusted temporarily to facilitate that and to remove areas of friction that might be a timing delay, but that otherwise, you know, there's opportunities to preserve some of the substantive um, areas that protect investors and that can really go to the core of how you raise capital from investors, but that there are ways that we can really improve upon the framework that we have to make it work even better for small businesses. And we take those very seriously and are having a lot of conversations on how we can be supportive. Does that answer your question, Gary? Yes, thank you. All right, any other COVID-19 questions? All right, if not, what I'm gonna do, and you can save them if they come up at the end, um, we'll also have our contact information that's on this. You, you can email business at sec.gov. We'll have that later on in the slides. But if you do have any questions and ones that you may not want to ask during the presentation, feel free to reach out to us directly. We're happy to set up time to talk and to be accessible to you. So what I wanted to dive into um, was one of the topics that NSBA reached out about, which was talk to us about this report that you delivered to Congress. Um, we have a mandate to report to Congress and to flag issues and to talk about what's happening with capital raising. And we put together an annual report. I'll actually put it on the screen for those that are watching this on your computer. Um, you can click on the link to our webpage and you'll see a link, a thumbnail to download a copy of this report. You can also scan the QR code with your mobile device just by opening it in camera mode and holding it in front of that icon. Um, but this is different than most reports you may have seen. And I want to highlight some of the things that are in here because this isn't just a Times New Roman document with um, some lovely text about what we see happening, but it's got a lot of data in there. And I think that data is particularly empowering to understand what people are doing elsewhere in the country and in different industries to raise capital, how they're finding success, and ways that you can learn from that and to utilize the resources that exist for you to raise capital for your own businesses. So I want to highlight a few elements of that that I think are particularly interesting for NSBA type companies. So I'm going to dive in. Um, so most of the data sources that we reported on are a mix of our own internal data uh, because we do have our own internal data through our division of economic and risk analysis but we also reference a number of other third-party sources um, so a lot more information about that's available but this is a mix so i'll start with this how are early stage small businesses accessing capital 
Um, this may be no surprise to many of you that the two top ways, and most people have a stack of multiple sources of capital, but the two top ways a lot of businesses start out are using personal funds or retain business earnings. Um, and then they go into loans and lines of credit, credit cards, and then lastly, equity from investors. Um, and this is from a Fed survey from 2019. What I think is interesting about this is it highlights, you know, if you have personal funds or you're able to get a credit card or a loan, then you're in great shape. But there's a lot of folks that that it's not an option and retain business earnings is only an option if your business has cash flow um, right now a lot of businesses are seeing a complete halt in cash flow um, and in many cases they've got no revenue coming in but they still got expenses that are going out the door that's the case for I think most businesses right now and so that really changes the need for capital from different sources another contributing factor that we've seen is the decline in community banks has really impacted emerging businesses. Um, this chart shows what's happened in 10-year increments over time with the number of FDIC-insured community banks. And we have seen a shrinkage of the number of banks that might have been across the street from you and have known your business, they knew you, and that made that lending process a smoother process for you. Um, with that, we've also got some data that's in our report about the the increased costs of underwriting many of those loans and what that has done to smaller amounts of capital that people may need to raise. So I switch from data on sources of capital and lending into data on kind of private offerings and public offerings because I think that this is particularly interesting and I want to highlight this and then I think that it would be interesting if Jody after I talk a little bit about what this slide is covering if we share a little bit of the poll results that might be informative um, as to how each of you have gone about raising capital and the sources that you're looking at. So this is the scope of you know how capital is raised and how much is raised on an annual basis looking at the different tools and regulatory pathways. So on the far right, you see public offerings. And most of you are familiar with initial public offerings or IPOs. It's when a company initially lists to go public. And people think that that is the biggest source of capital. And it is a big source of capital for many companies. But as you see on the public offering front, it is the other registered offerings, such as when a public company goes and does a secondary issuance and they issue more capital. Um, that that actually raises a whole lot more money per year, around $1.2 trillion. About $50 billion um, was raised in initial public offerings for a median of a $90 million IPO. But then we look over at the left-hand side at private offerings. And this is an area where, you know, we're very interested as an office in the entirety of this picture. Um, but we hear a lot about the left side. And you look at the different tools that we have available and you've got private placements 506b and that sounds you're thinking okay i signed into a webinar and somebody is speaking in you know gibberish regulatory code um, but i flagged the, t the title of that that's what most people refer to as private placement so if you go and raise capital from friends and family from an angel investor or from you know a venture fund or some other investor in the private markets, it's typically done through Rule 506B. And $1.4 trillion annually, thereabouts, is raised with that. Um, it, it fluctuates year to year um, for a median offering size of 1.9 million. And I think it's interesting to look at both the aggregate as well as the median because 1.4 trillion is more than was raised in the public markets with companies that are you know, registered reporting companies. But you look at individually, those transactions are actually much smaller and there's a lot of activity that's happening funding small businesses. There's a couple of other pathways here, accredited investor crowdfunding 506C. Um, that's when you can raise unlimited amounts of capital over the internet from accredited investors. Um, 504, those are limited offerings that tend to be smaller in size. Um, Reg A is often referred to as a miniature IPO. You can raise um, up to $50 million. We proposed increasing that to $75 million, um, which I'll cover later. And then regulation crowdfunding. Um, crowdfunding in this context, you probably are all familiar with um, you know, your Indiegogos and your Kickstarters and the ways that you can raise money from potential customers who pre-purchase product. Um, that's often referred to as rewards crowdfunding. They don't actually own a piece of your company in response. Um, this is looking at when you're raising through a registered portal 
and the investors actually own a piece of your company at the end of it. And as you'll see, that's a newer offering type, and it still has not caught on quite in prevalence and scale relative to the other types of ways you can raise capital. So I, I find this slide to be really interesting, um, particularly with these dots drawn relatively to scale, because it just shows the various different tools and how people are using them. I think this is a good moment to pause, and I would love to know, Jody or Molly, some of the data that you guys um, are seeing from the polls, we asked some questions about where people are looking to raise capital. Um, is that something that you're able to share and see some of the initial results from the participants on this call? It is, Martha, and um, I guess I'll just ask you, is, is my sound coming across okay? I know we were having some issues with Jody, and she's trying to get that resolved, but uh, can everybody hear me okay? You sound great. Okay, yes. perfect. <laughs> great. Um, let me go ahead and click the uh, share results piece of the poll. And that's going to show up on everybody's screen. So you'll be able to look uh, real time and see what that data is, Martha. Wonderful. Oh, this is great to see. So let's see, how has COVID-19 changed how you're approaching whether and when you need capital. I am not surprised by these results. Um, for those um, in the not at all category, I am thrilled for you. <laughs> you are. Um, hopefully well equipped to weather this. For those in the somewhat and the major changes category, I hope you know you're not alone um, and that that is something that that is following the national trends and that we really understand and appreciate that the need for capital has changed and so I um, appreciate you sharing that feedback with us. Question two, when your business needs capital, where do you look? Um, interesting to see, it looks like a lot of folks have followed very similarly along the lines of um, the survey results that we shared a little bit, almost double um, the survey results looking at equity from investors, which means that you dialed into the right call for those who are interested in that and for those who've typically looked at the top four categories, credit cards, loans, retained business earnings, and personal funds. Hopefully you'll learn something new that can allow you to understand how you might be able to go about um, finding equity from investors as an additional tool to have in your toolkit. So the most daunting aspect of raising investment capital, cost. Um, that's one that we hear a lot, um, including transaction costs, the cost of just legal fees, accounting fees, and other elements. Um, I think depending on the pathway that you use and the relationship you have with your investors and how many investors, that can change the cost quite a bit. Um, interesting to see that dilution is not the most daunting relative to the others. I think it's always a concern for any founder. Finding investors, though, 30%, so about a third of you, that's a topic that we hear a lot about, and so I would welcome feedback from any of you about the process of finding investors, because we know that that's something that's particularly challenging um, if you're not in a hotbed where there are a bunch of funds and angel groups that are there, and then complexity. Um, this chart shows there's a lot of different pathways. Um, the one behind us, um, behind the screen, um, so sensitive there, let's see. Okay, so predominantly entrepreneurs, not surprised at all by that. Love to see some who are advocates and advisors and investors who are joining. Um, and if any of you want to receive emails about future SEC Small Business Advocate events, I would love to share those with you and for you to join us for other events that we do virtually or in person and to stay in touch with us. So these are very helpful results. Thank you all for filling these out. I'm gonna close out of that, perfect. Martha? Um, okay. Yes. This is Jody. Um, there are a number of questions coming in, and I just saw one that maybe I'll ask now only because Perfect. he's asking about um, the last funding option that you mentioned uh, on your screen. So uh, she's, he's asking, if um, can you discuss a little more on the process and requirements to the last funding option? Um, very interesting. The last funding option being crowdfunding? Um, the last one I talked about. Yes, I think the last one you're talked about. Um, yes. And if I'm incorrect, then I ask uh, the person who asked our question, David, to, um, to resubmit that question, but I believe that's what he's asking. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I said right now while I'm in, just a full disclosure, while I'm in the screen share mode, I can't see the Q&A box, so I apologize if I missed the follow-up question. If you'll just flag that for me, Jody, when that comes through. Um, so on crowdfunding, 
Um, typically what you do is you go through the process of finding a portal. Um, there's a number of different registered portals that are out there and then those portals can help walk you through the different requirements. To be able to sell securities over the internet using crowdfunding, um, which we're seeing increased interest in doing so, particularly with social distancing, people realize, okay, I'm going to need to use the internet for more than just ordering and seeing if I can find the goods that are not available in person in stores. Um, but also it could be an option to raise money from, you know, potential investors who I know, um, potential customers who are very loyal and would like to own a piece of the company and to share in the long-term success and support of the business. And so when you go through the process of working with a portal to get your offering registered, um, you'll go through a variety of steps. Um, you'll need to have your financials ready and depending on how much money you're looking to raise, that will change the level of financial information that you have to have ready to disclose. Um, and then you'll go through getting some offering documents ready, figure out how much you're looking to raise and at what valuation. And we'll go through the process of getting that offering ready to list and to market online and to prepare an offering page with materials that tell the story of your company and why you're looking to raise capital and what somebody should be thinking about if they're looking to become an investor in you. Um, there's a lot more, as, as with anything, there's a lot more nuance to it. We've got some good information that's linked on our webpage um, with small business resources and how you go about a crowdfunding offering and things to be thinking about there. Um, so I encourage you to check that out and certainly reach out to our office to the extent that we can be helpful and provide more information. Great. Thank you, Martha. And I think there may be one more that uh, I can ask right now if that's okay. Absolutely. Great. Um, Kevin is saying, I see no reference to companies accessing commercial finance products. Are they reflected in one of these categories? So that's a great question. So these are categories that reflect capital raised from investors as opposed to lending and other sources of capital, which fall outside of what the SEC looks at. So we certainly look at those resources. We're aware of trends and what's happening with those, but this, um, this chart and this diagram is really focused on sources of investor capital, as opposed to lending sources, grant sources, um, credit card financing, and, and other tools. Great. Thank you. I think uh, we'll pause there and uh, there's plenty of other questions coming in, but I'll filter them through. I want you to continue, be able to continue on with the presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do is I'll share a couple more slides that just give some information about the nature of capital that's raised in the private markets. I can pause it in there and then I will switch into sharing a little bit about the proposal that we put out um, just over a month ago that is intended to improve and to build upon some of the tools and to make them more accessible and to reduce friction for how you could raise capital using all of these different pathways that we see on this screen. So this is a map of the United States and it's a heat map and what we've done is taken um, four of the really prominent offering pathways that you saw on the prior screen and shown the distribution of how companies are using them to raise capital across the country. Um, I don't know if you're like me, but whenever I look at a map like this, I always zero in on my home state of Alabama and I look to see what's happening. Um, and so that's, I have a feeling that many of you are looking at these maps and are looking at your own state and saying, oh, that's interesting. I had no idea, you know, how many companies are using that tool or how few. Um, but one of the things that you do see looking at this is that there is still a wide distribution of the success levels that companies are having and the volume of activity that happens in each of the different states. Um, you know, Regulation D in the top left corner, that's the one that was the big bubble that was $1.4 trillion, or just over that actually, um, that was on the far left, compared to registered offerings, the bottom right, that was the bubble that was on the right hand side, showing just what's happening in that space, and then the other two, Equity Crowdfunding and Reg A, were in the middle. So it just, it breaks down and shows a little bit more context about where capital is raised um, by different businesses. So angel investing is a topic that when we talk to entrepreneurs and early stage companies, they always want to talk about angel investors because that's one of the first places if you don't have the capital yourself and you don't have the network of friends or family 
that might be looking to support you. Most people then turn to find the angels in their community, which really means high net worth people that tend to be repeat investors in smaller companies and earlier stage companies. And that make investments of varying different sizes. You know, the average angel tends to invest between $5,000 and $100,000 when they make an investment. And there are a lot of active angel investors across the country. I recommend for those who are interested in learning more about angels in their area to find out if there is a local angel capital network that meets um, many communities. Um, I mean, I know in my own home city of Birmingham, Alabama, I live in DC now, but I still, I will always call Alabama home. Uh, we've got an angel network in Alabama that meets and they talk about different companies and they raise visibility of what's happening with early stage investing. So I encourage you to find out out a little bit more about if there's angel investors in your area to the extent that's something interesting to you. Um, but this is just some data showing what the scale of angel investing looks like early stage because I think that it's particularly interesting to see what sort of activity happens when you're looking at individuals who are investing in other early stage companies. Most angel investors tend to be accredited investors, which means the high net worth or high income individuals. Um, you'll see on the left hand side the current requirements. Um, if you're looking at the income thresholds, it is about $200,000 of individual income or 300 of family income. Or if you're using a net worth standard, it's $1 million. And about 13% of US households currently qualify as accredited investors. Um, that's that broad distribution across the country because depending on where you live, um, the average income and net worth tends to vary quite significantly. Um, but I think that it's helpful to look at the accredited investor standards because that tends to be how uh, that tends to correlate, correlate um, with the angel investor community. Um, and I highlighted earlier that we had proposed some changes that would add additional means of qualifying outside of just using monetary limitations, but also looking at financial sophistication. So to the extent that you have questions or want to talk about it, happy to do so, but thought I would flag that one here because I think that it's some interesting information. So that, I'll pause um, right there on data. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any on there, or I can give a very brief preview of some of the recommendations that we delivered to Congress. Um, we, do have, we do have some other questions coming in, so maybe I'll just ask a couple. Um, we'll move on to recommendations and then come back to the questions, because um, I do see several that have come in. Um, so, um, Char is, Charles is asking, are the requirements for the different funding sources on the SEC website, and then how do you register show the funding that you have received? Those are both great questions. So, there's a lot of information on the SEC's website. If you go to our webpage, sec.gov slash OASB, you'll see links over to some information about the different requirements. Um, and we are working as an office on some new educational content that makes um, additional information even more accessible. Um, so I you know, am looking forward to that being something that's an additional toolkit that's available. In terms of how you register it, depending on um, the way that you raise capital and the tool that you use. It has different requirements for what types of forms or other things that you file. Um, typically, the, the phrase registration is used in the context of a public offering. And then there may be some filings that are used. For example, if you do crowdfunding, you would file a Form C that provides certain notice information to the SEC. Um, but all of that is on the website and there is wonderful information out there, probably more information than any of you were looking to read. Um, it is a helpful source for you to brush up on all of it and it can, depending on, on how deep you want to dive, it can be a helpful thing to help you snooze um, if you're having trouble sleeping during COVID-19 <laughs> because we have plenty of PDFs that are hundreds of pages long if you want to dive into those, but we also have some good summary level info. Great. Um, and this one kind of falls in line with this, um, and this person has provided their initials. So RPH has asked, um, should we register with SEC before making application for making an offering? So again, that's a great question. And that really determined, that's, that's based on what type of offering you're doing. So I can't speak with broad generalities, but many of them do require that you submit a form either in advance 
of raising capital using the tools or within a certain time period after you have received your first commitment from investors. Okay, great. And uh, maybe we'll do just one more now and then we can yeah. continue on with these because these are great questions coming in and I do want to try and get to them. Um, Absolutely. So Kevin asks, what percentage of small businesses in total are accessing capital through these pathways? Are they scale, scalable businesses or lifestyle businesses? That's a great question. And that really goes to the return profile for the investment. And so for many businesses, you know, when you're looking at the businesses that are going to rapidly scale and grow, they tend to raise a lot of capital from investors, particularly if they're going to need a lot of capital before they see revenue. Um, so certainly those businesses raise a good bit from investors, but lifestyle businesses also find success depending on the investor's interest and the profile of that company. Um, it's hard to speak in broad generalities about the specific companies. We've seen a lot of more lifestyle businesses be very successful with crowdfunding. That's what we've heard from a lot of the portals. For example, um, we've heard stories about, you know, the neighborhood pizza shop that needed to replace the oven after an oven fire um, had a lot of success raising capital from those who were used to going after, you know, baseball games and events in town and wanted to make sure that that pizza restaurant was still there. It was a part of their, you know, their Friday night routine. And so um, they had a lot of success raising funding on crowdfunding portals. Um, so we hear just different stories and it really depends on the nature of the business. Um, but the lifestyle businesses, it sounds like, tend to have the most success from an engaged customer base, tends to be the, the primary supporters that we hear about. Great, I think we'll pause the questions there, Martha, and we'll, we'll pick them up after you uh, finish with the policy recommendations. Perfect. Well, and I'm going to be quick with this part because I'm happy I can, I can nerd out with these and we can talk for hours on them. Um, but we give a couple recommendations. We narrowed it down to five. We tried to prioritize our five recommendations to Congress and to the commission around harmonization, which is really around improving the ways that the rules work together, um, looking at how investors participate in private offerings. The third, um, and it goes to the, the poll that we shared earlier, finding investors and the ability to use someone that could be a bridge or an intermediary. The fourth was improving crowdfunding and making some changes there. And then the fifth is around scaled obligations for public companies. Um, you're welcome. We, we're ha I'm happy to have a conversation about any of those in detail, but there's a lot more about those in our report. Um, this is a good moment to dive in because harmonization was the first recommendation. You might think harmonization, I'm used to hearing that term in the context of a symphony, um, but that's a, a good analogy for looking at the ways that the different rules, and when we looked at all those bubbles in a line, how they work together and how you could go from raising money, for example, using crowdfunding, and then do another offering with some angel investors who are cutting maybe some larger checks using a different tool and how you can raise capital incrementally, and then what changes are needed to make the rules work with less friction. And so this summer, we put out a concept release asking for feedback on ways that we can simplify and improve the ways that entrepreneurs raise capital. We received wonderful input via comment letters, and on March 4th, we proposed amendments right before everything went and shut down. It's um, it was a little bit of a chaotic time that it happened to get out right then. And so we are actively looking for feedback and trying to raise the visibility of this because it is so important to small businesses who are looking to raise capital. Um, generally, this proposal retains the existing framework, but is looking at reducing areas of friction. And so um, happy to highlight a couple of the ways that that happens and then can take some questions there and would welcome any of you who have thoughts or feedback on ways that you think that this can be improved to share that with us. So the first is we looked at increasing the offering limits and how much money you can raise. So crowdfunding used to be limited to just over a million dollars. The limited offerings used to be limited as well as Reg A at $50 million. So proposing some increased caps to allow you to raise a little bit more money. The next is harmonizing investor disclosures. So what that really goes to is making sure that there's parity in the type of information you need to prepare and provide 
to investors in different types of offerings that just make it more seamless and intuitive for both the company and the investors to know what to expect and what they're getting in each case. Testing the waters, um, that's something that most of you, if you're near a body of water and you're actually getting out close, so this is the time of year where you dip your toe in and you figure out if it is too cold to swim and if you're going to wait another week or for a warmer day. Um, the same is the case when you're raising capital. Um, a lot of companies want to go out and test and figure out, is this actually a good time? Am, am I talking about my company in the right way? Is there sufficient interest that I should actually go down the path? of incurring the costs and expenses. And so we have proposed ways that companies can go out and gauge market interest prior to doing a crowdfunding offering or doing other types of offerings. This is something that public companies are able to do. And it's something that we're proposing that we make available to entrepreneurs as well. So another one is crowdfunding. Um, there's currently limits on how much each individual investor can put into a company, and we have proposed to remove the investment limits on accredited investors. So those are, again, those high net worth, high income individuals who don't have limits in other contexts. So allowing those folks to, rate, to um, put more money into companies, and which will help the smaller businesses raise more money in the aggregate. Um, we've also proposed allowing investors to pool together when they're using a crowdfunding vehicle and what's called a special purpose vehicle. This is something that gets into some of the nitty gritty um, legal um, topics, but it's something that we've heard a lot about. So there's a proposal for how that might work. And then demo days. Many of you may be familiar with entrepreneur demo days where companies come in and they pitch their company to investors. And so we have proposed um, an exemption that allows demo days and other similar pitch events to occur without being challenging from a regulatory perspective. And then this is one, this is a lawyer's favorite topic, integration, um, which really looks to um, the complexities for how you can move step-by-step step across different types of offerings and either concurrent or successive capital raising rounds without having them merge together and you needing to comply with the most stringent requirements from each of them. Um, that gets into the nitty-gritty. I won't go into to terrible detail on that unless anybody wants to talk about harm, not harmonization, integration. Um, and then again, looking ahead, we are conducting a series of virtual coffee breaks as an office discussing capital raising various different topics, but also soliciting feedback on these proposed changes. Um, the comment period on these rules is open until June 1st, 2020. It is so important that we get meaningful feedback so that we can take this proposal and hone it and to make important updates to the rules that can benefit each of you. Um, if you have never participated in the comment process before, it is not hard. It's not daunting. If you go to our website, we've actually got a video on how easy it can be and demystifying it. It can be as simple as sending an email to our rulemaking file that says why you think this rule matters, what's important to you. It can have bullet points. Um, it does not have to be something that is long and polished or that is written by lawyers. It is so important that we hear from those who actually want to use the rules and raise capital so that we get the rules right. Um, so I flag all of that and I put our contact info up one more time um, with our website and our email address. I welcome you to reach out to us and to talk to us about what matters most to you. Um, and with that, I think it's time to switch back over to Q&A and to give people a chance to get some additional answers to the questions that you have. Hey, yes, Martha. Hey, thank you for such a great overview. I'm going to start the Q&A with a, kind of a simple question. Um, you just referenced the SEC proposed rule on facilitating capital formation. And yes. there's an amendment on there about uh, non-accredited investors being able to rely on the greater of their net income or their net worth. And I'm curious about the net worth. Uh, a lot of business owners, um, they put their own value on their business regarding what their net worth might be. And so would this proposed rule require an appraisal of the business owner's net worth or would for them to be an investor or would it just go by their book value? So that's a great question, Gary. Um, and that, that just for context for those who have looked at this, and I love it that you've gone in and looked at the rules there um, on the you know non-accredited investors front that is the 
proposed change for crowdfunding. So right now, um, for investing, the limits applied on the lower of your income or net worth. And so this would propose for you to use the higher of. So for example, if you're a high net worth person, but you're, you know, you're retired, but you have made a lot of money and you want to invest it, um, that gives you the ability to use a little bit different, um, to look at the greater of the two numbers as opposed to the lesser. Um, in terms of calculating net worth, there's actually some, um, some lovely nitty gritty. You can get way in the weeds on how you go about calculating it, um, but it would, we could use the entire rest of the time that we have arranged for this. But there's actually some very prescriptive means for going about and ascertaining net worth. Um, much of it ultimately comes down to the investor certifying and providing information and the company having a reasonable belief that it is true and accurate. Okay, thank you, Martha. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank, thank you, Gary. And um, Martha, we'll, we'll move over to some of these other questions that have come in. Um, I know we are aiming to end our webinar at 11. So Martha, if it's okay with you, if we don't get to everybody's questions, can I pass them on to you and um, the staff you so did. maybe you can respond and get back to me? Yes, and one of my colleagues, Jenny Riebel in our office, who's fabulous, just sent me a text message to remind me to point you towards investor.gov, which has a tool. Um, investor.gov is maintained by the SEC in our Office of Investor Education and Advocacy, and they have a tool for calculating um, online. So I um, suggest that you look over at that because that can be a good resource if you're looking at figuring out just whether or not you are accredited or not, Gary. Great. That's Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so let's, let's go on to some of these questions. Okay, how has your office worked to help impact, in, help impact investment funds, private equity, private debt, to address the Corporate Transparency Act, specifically the ownership issue and reporting the ownership changes burden on small businesses? So that is a great question and one that we have not been very involved with because it's a little bit outside of the scope of what our office has done. Um, but I would welcome feedback from whoever asked the question. Um, it sounds like from just the way the question is phrased that you're very familiar with the issue. So I would welcome you to reach out to our office, shoot us an email and would love to hear your thoughts and perspectives on it. Great. Yes, that is, a, uh, that is an issue that uh, NSBA and our membership have been tracking and following for a long time. So I, I will encourage, I think that came from uh, Natalie, to definitely uh, follow up and send an email uh, to your office. Um, this is another one that's come in. Um, does your office have any role in the EB5 program? And if so, what can you tell us about this role? So in terms of role, so that EB-5 program is not run by the SEC, but it is one that, you know, to be eligible and to get the benefits of the EB-5 program when somebody has invested, it goes through an investment vehicle um, that tends to be something that is going into a smaller business. And so we are um, cognizant of the issues posed by the EB-5 program. We don't administer that program, but we are very much familiar with it. And there's a number of bulletins and guidance that the SEC more generally has put out related to the EB-5 program um, for those that are interested or that are looking at that as a way to raise capital from foreign investors. Great. Um, this one asks, is there any discussion on the Hill concerning limiting the banks from pulling lines? We have heard of lenders doing this to some who are participating in the, in the uh, PPP loans program that, from, uh, that came from uh, the virus. The lenders are also placing their own limitations on how existing lines are used given the PPP loan is focused on payroll. So to the answer of, are there any discussions on the Hill? That would require me to have a, a wire in every single room to know <laughs> the entirety of it, um, which I don't profess to have. And I think if anybody has information about it, it's happening more broadly, um, kudos to them, but also scary how you got that info. Um, I think there's <laughs> a variety of fronts. 
um, with the challenges that are posed by a brand new program. Anything that is implemented that quickly has challenges. And we have heard a lot from companies. We've heard from banks. Uh, my sister in the middle of this has a small business. She is a sole proprietor and has been sending me text messages that have been making my phone vibrate this entire time about her questions she has about the PPP program. So I hear about them at work. I hear about them on my personal cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, it is not something that we are at all immune to the challenges that businesses are facing going through it, as well as the issues that banks are going through figuring out how to launch a program. And um, to the extent that you have any questions or want to talk about any of it, um, you're welcome to reach out to our office. We are not directly responsible for administering any elements of the program, but we are in communication with those who are and are happy to pass that feedback along. Great. Thank you, Martha. I think we can maybe get to a couple more. Um, is there a format or examples of what needs to be provided to the investors? So that's a great question. So what we do as an agency, we are not what you would call, this is going to get to a lovely, it's going to sound very lawyerly, but I am a lawyer, so I, I can't help myself. <laughs> We're not a merit regulator. And what that means is that we don't dive into the merits of your company, but we have instead a disclosure-based regime. And what that means is we put forth um, requirements and rules around the type of disclosures that you need to make but we don't put out a specific form agreement, for example, that you need to use because that's really something that belongs to be negotiated between the investor and the company. And for that to be a very market-driven transaction, so our involvement on exactly what you give to the investors, um, we have some specific requirements that are more um, high level. And then it tends to be that there are market trends. I will say that there are a number of of law firms and entrepreneurial support organizations, um, you know, Venture Capital Association has made their documents available that they want all VC funds to use similar documents to make it easier to navigate and to reduce transaction costs. Um, you'll find that there's a wide variety in the types of form documents you see out there. It is so important that you understand what is in those documents and to not just pull a document that sounds like it's from a great source but to talk to somebody who can advise you, whether that is a lawyer or somebody who is really experienced in business that can be a, a guiding source yeah. for you because you want to make sure that you fully understand the terms because you are entering into um, a long-term relationship with those businesses and it is with those investors. And it is so important that you understand what happens when things go well and what happens when things encounter a little bit more friction. Great. And I think we'll just take this one last one because it, it, uh, it's, it's twofold, but I think it, it ends on, on looking at the future. So the first part says, um, you mentioned that the comment periods have been extended. So what is the new timeline for the accredited investor definition changes? And then the second part of that is, what are your office's plans for 2020? Great question. So the comment period for accredited investor has been extended to May 1st, which means that's the date on which we hope to have received feedback so that we can then begin working as an agency on the final rules. So I'm um, very hopeful that that all continues to move quickly and that final rules can be out there and provide clarity because again, it is just a proposed rule right now. So it's not an effective change yet to the rules. Um, and, this, and the same goes for other proposals where we have a comment period that's opening that's open mm -hmm. in terms of our the plans for our office for 2020 um, a lot of them have been flipped upside down i think if i <laughs> ask all of you on if, if i pull everybody who's here on what are your plans for 2020 i think we might get a few shoulder shrugs <laughs> a few that they're they're changing I'll, I'll tell you in a month i'd like to get a little bit more clarity on what's happening more broadly in the country. Um, for us, we have shifted and, and focused entirely on meeting the needs of businesses and their investors where they are right now. And they've changed a lot since January. When we were looking at our plans for 2020 before the year began, we had a different focus. And we had shifted, like every business has, into a different mindset that is incredibly responsive and, um, reactive to the current environment, but we're also trying to not just play defense, but to play offense, to look 
a step ahead and to try to um, provide guiding resources and supportive resources to businesses and investors while also fulfilling our mandate and working behind the scenes quite a lot um, with other agencies, with our colleagues across the agency to make sure that um, every other current priority and agenda item and rulemaking initiative still has the support and the voice of small business is being brought to the table. Great. Thank you. I I do want to be mindful of everybody's time, and so it's just after 11, but Martha, as you can see, I think we can probably keep this conversation going for a couple more hours here, but I, I do appreciate all your time today. I've already gotten feedback from folks saying that this your slides were so helpful, so informative. Um, so I think this has been a really, a really great presentation, and, and I thank you so much for uh, your time and your insight, um, and uh, to everybody for joining NSBA's Economic Is uh, Development Issue Committee uh, webinar today. Thank you so much, Martha, for being with us. Absolutely, and Jody and Gary and Molly and the entire Right, and SBA team. I thank each of you and I look forward to this not just being a one-time conversation, but this being a conversation that we continue. Um, seriously, for those who are on the phone, reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. We talk often and regularly to small businesses across the country and we would love to hear from you and do whatever we can to support you right now and in the future. Great, thank you. Yes, and everybody is saying this is this has been really valuable information, much needed and much appreciated. So I just want to echo that. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining our our call today. Gary and I always welcome any questions or suggestions that you may have at any time throughout your service on this committee. We always encourage members to bring new issues uh, for discussion. Uh, if, you, if your question was not able to get to, please feel free to email, email me and I will get them to Martha and her team. And as a reminder, you can always visit nsba.biz for the latest updates on your issue on issues facing your small business. I will mention that we do have a COVID-19 resource page, um, so I highly recommend that you uh, browse through there. There's plenty of resources and information that um, we hope is helpful. And then you can always follow us on Twitter at NSBA Advocate. Thank you all for joining our webinar today. Uh, this concludes our meeting.